for a different purpose, something we may all be doing soon if we run out of toilet paper. Um, but uh, And so if you pass someone food, it's an insult. All right, pointing the soul, see if I can do this without falling over. There we go. I just insulted everyone uh, watching this video. Pointing the sole of the shoe toward the head of another. American man, da, 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 da. Uh, in, in, this is quite unacceptable in cultures such as Thailand or the Arab world. In the U.S., however, it carries no negative meaning. All right, let's see. Anything else here? Um, no. Uh, and, 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 and I have something else to read to you. Well, okay, let me just jump to this real quick. All right, so, so I'm reading this book to my class, you know, uh, probably 20 years ago. Actually, I can tell you because this book is 1992. Um, let's see, and this is, that would be 20. Oh, God, good Lord, it had to be longer than that. All right, so I'm reading this book, and one of the German students in class goes, Ach, uh, they hand out a book just like that to us here at TCU. I was like, really? I didn't know that. So I went straight over to Almladenka, was the name of the man who was in charge, John Singleton now, in charge of international students. And I said, you've got a, a book, uh, uh, and he, he gave me this, a copy of this. And A, it's very similar to the other book. Now, it, it opens with stuff about, you know, uh, income tax, Social Security, and stuff like that. Uh, but um, here's the important part. Social customs. And it teaches you how to date. All right. Now, I know that many of you have been shy about bringing this up, but you don't know how. And so I'm glad that we have this time right now where everyone is stuck at home to where I can, I can give you a, a rundown on this and then you can practice uh, so that once you are free again, then you can uh, engage in, there's the dog, engage in dating in a manner like you've never had before. All right. So here, here is what TCU sent to foreign students in 1992, all right, uh, in, I assume, some years thereafter. When in Rome, do as the Romans do, is an expression that you have probably heard before coming to America. Now that you are in America, you may be asking, but what do they do? What does this custom mean? What is the extended middle finger? It doesn't say that. Um, then, let's see, you ask us, and we will enjoy letting you know about it. Okay, greetings. As a gesture of friendliness, if a person offers you his hand, you should shake it. It doesn't tell you how to shake okay. it. Uh, you should shake it. Uh, many times, men are the only ones who shake hands in a mixed group. That's Catholics and Protestants. If a woman offers her hand first, yeah, yeah, yeah. good Lord. Um, all right. An acknowledgement such as, how do you do? Or, I'm glad to meet you, is appropriate. Just because, crap, I lost my page. Just because people say, how are you? doesn't mean they wish to hear about your health conditions. They are simply using it as a greeting or a recognition of you. Doesn't that sound silly? Now, gosh, how many years ago was it now? Probably five years ago. Uh, ooh, we were having a really good football season. I remember that. Uh, and um, I went, uh, TCU always sends somebody uh, to, the stu to the study abroad students to, uh, you know, once a semester to make sure everything's okay. All right, so, so I was lucky enough to get to go to London and visit with our students at Roehampton and uh, I can't remember the other, name of the other university, but it's, but it's in London. And I knew they were going to bring this up. And almost to a person, they said it took them a while to get used to, you all right? And that in England, that just means, how are you? It doesn't mean, oh, uh, well, I'm a little constipated, actually. Uh, you don't, they're not asking for your health conditions. Yet all of them were, everybody's confused by, you all right? Uh, as these foreigners are to, how are you? All right? And yet, Americans grew up with, how are you? And yet, y'all right, uh, they didn't understand. Uh, anyway, it was very funny that almost everybody brought that up as it took them a while to get used to, oh, they're not asking, uh, you know, like, right, am I bleeding? Uh, and um, so no, that's just saying hi. Now, uh, let's see here. Americans adopt a friendly, casual attitude with new acquaintances and may call you by your first name immediately. Yeah. Invitations. Uh, let's see here. Okay, 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 here's a good one. Uh, to accept the first invitation in America is not offensive. If a person asks you for a specific occasion, he sincerely hopes you will accept. Now, I read this out for years before a student from Colombia, and I don't know if this is a general Colombian cultural factor or whatever, but she said, oh, I know what that means. Because I could never figure out to accept the first invitation in America is not offensive. Why would it be offensive? She said, well, it's like this. Let's say you're taking this class with a couple of your friends, all right? And, you know, you chit-chat before class and after class, certainly not during class. Uh, and uh, that a fourth person has become friendly with, with the three of you. And you will also chat with that person. And after class one day, you say, hey, the three of us are going to Starbucks. You want to go? The fourth person is really supposed to say no. The fourth person is supposed to understand they were just being polite. 
all right? Uh, but really, you don't know them well enough. It would be actually sort of intrusive to accept. So you need to be invited several times. And once they've invited you three or four times, you're like, oh, yeah, sure, okay, yeah, because they really want you to go, all right? Um, and, okay, I, I can see how that would be uh, one of these areas where you could easily uh, commit a, not crime, if you will, but uh, misunderstand somebody else's culture. Now, let's see... If a person offers you several invitations and you refuse them all, he accepts you do not wish to visit with him socially. He may stop asking you. And it's still going on about the, uh, the, the first time someone asks you, it's okay. So obviously, again, and remember the whole point of this is that the institutionalists are arguing that so much of what we do is simply cultural. So much of what we do is a set of relatively arbitrary rules that, uh, that we nevertheless make a big deal out of, that are very important to us. Now, uh, there are things that aren't arbitrary. Hey, guess what? Eskimos tend to wear more clothes than people on the equator. I mean, I could have worked that out logically. You could have told me that there are people who live in sub-zero temperatures and there are people who live, you know, in whatever the temperature is in the equator, and I would have been able to figure, I'll bet they wear more clothes up near the Arctic Circle, all right? But I couldn't tell you logically where it's okay to maintain eye contact and where it's not. All right, there's no way to work that out logically. All right? uh, and so it is arbitrary. And yet, it is so important to us all right, that people follow these rules. All right, so, so let me continue here because I haven't gotten to the dating part yet. Uh, Americans assume you'll arrive on time. All right, let's see here. Uh, now, they're making some of this up. You should arrive at a dance within a half an hour after the time stated on the invitation. Maybe I'm wrong. You should arrive at a theater at least 15 minutes before curtain time. Uh, good Lord. All right. So I, I, I keep imagining this for, poor foreign students in, in 1992 with an index card jotting down all these important rules that someone made up. Uh, let's see here. Visiting American Home says some of the same stuff that the other book did. Uh, table manner. Oh, oh, oh. Where's this one? All right. Get this. If you are on a small financial budget, uh, let's see. A reasonable price for a modest meal is approximately $5. Not anymore. Not if you supersize it. All right. Let's see here. Uh, it says Americans like to, to, to eat out at restaurants a lot. Table manners. Don't be burping all the time. Uh, let's see here. Uh, oh, yeah. In fact, there's a section on that. A large slice of bread should be broken into smaller pieces before putting butter on it? Oh, no. It's much more efficient to have a huge piece of bread, put the butter on, and then eat it afterwards. But that's just me. Uh, let's see if you don't want uh, to make mouth noises uh, while drinking liquids or eating food is considered bad manners. You should chew quietly with no smacking noises and drink liquids without sucking and slurping sounds. Burping after a meal is not acceptable in America as good manners. If it happens accidentally, merely say, who the hell was that? And then continue with whatever you were doing. Uh, it actually says, excuse me, dress and grooming, time schedules, as my mother would say. Tipping. Oh, my God. I hate tipping in other countries because you never know whether you're coming off as the arrogant American by putting, you know, a big tip or you're looking like a jerk for not tipping much at all. Um, in England, you don't tip as much. In England, if you're at a bar, you don't really tip the bartender. You might at the end of the night, you know, if you've been there a long day, yeah, here, have yourself a beer. Uh, you know, but, but really, it's not the way it is here with tipping, which means that when the English visit America, they become very unpopular in restaurants and bars. Like, oh, great, I hear a bunch of English accents. I'm not going to get any tip out of this table whatsoever uh, because they're not used to doing it. By the way, they're also bothered by the fact in England, and this is not a cultural thing, uh, but that when it says $5 on the price tag in America, there's still tax added on afterwards. Not in England. They've already got the tax included. So like, great. Not only do I have to tip, but you're adding stuff on at the end. Dating. Before you came to America, you probably heard or read about the dating customs here. Now that you are here, you'll probably notice the relaxed and friendly atmosphere between men and women, and if we were to update this, and men and men and women and women. To date someone or to go on a date with someone means to have an appointment with a friend of the opposite sex, not necessarily. Go to a movie, have dinner together, go to a friend's house, da 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 okay. To date someone means that you wish to know that person better. It does not mean that you wish to or have intentions of marrying that person. Intimacy should not be rushed into. The custom is for the man to ask the woman for a date. Now, I always like to interject right here. That, oh, I don't have my wedding ring on and don't wear it in the house, but I would not own that if I had stuck to the man asked the woman because Melanie had to ask me. Uh, because I hear my phone. It is in here somewhere. Oh, it's behind me. And it's Melanie. Pardon me. Yes, Melanie, I'm videoing right now. Oh, sorry. Well, I was going to ask you, could you... I'm getting ready to leave. Uh -huh.
Uh huh. Yes. Yes. Okay, bye. Okay. Uh, she wanted to know, she's making a run. I, I, I'm thinking of her right now as Glenn on Walking Dead, where she's going out and making a run to get supplies. Uh, she wanted to know if I would meet her in the driveway to unload the supplies, fight off any zombies, uh, and then that way she can go back out because she needs to get something from Home Depot. Anyway, that's an update on my life. Um, that's the woman that had asked me out because I did ask her out. I actually worked up the courage to do it, and she said no. She had a lot to do. It was a Saturday night at the University of Tennessee, and she was going to study. We know what that means. I don't like you. So I'm like, all right, well, that's the way it goes. Anyway, uh, so let's see. If you actually want to get married, the woman has to ask the man. Uh, if she accepts, uh, okay. Coffee dates are a good start. Perhaps you will have met the girl in class. Now suddenly it is written only to male students. Isn't that interesting? Um, introduce yourself. I am Ahmad. Um, then ask her if she has time for a coffee after class. After the coffee date, you may want to take her to a movie. Oh, but I have another class. No, no, we are going to a movie. Um, and uh, if you do not have a car, you may double date with a friend who has a car. And then it explains what a double date is. Um, it, now, I don't think this was true in 1992. It is acceptable to accompany your date in a taxi or a bus. Now, nowadays, we got Uber and Lyft, so maybe they'd be okay, but not so much back then. How's the lighting going? Okay, that's right. Um, I swear to God it says this. Always remember to take your date home. Never allow her to go home by her, at night by herself. To do so in this country is most rude! Exclamation point. What the hell was going on at TCU before 1992? That they had to say, by the way, We've been having to drive all over the Metroplex picking up these, uh, uh, apparently, women who have had dates that they're, you know, they're, they're, they're foreign um, daters, whatever you call that, uh, had just left them places. Uh, surely to goodness, that's not, I, I don't know, but they, they, they emphasized it. Very interesting. All right. Each person has the privilege to date other people at other times. Oh, my God. Now, you're not going to believe it says this, all right? Um, the woman's responsibility is to be in considerate of her date, especially the financial situations she's a student. She should not be, quote, encouraging, unquote. She does not plan to accept another date if asked to do so. I don't know what that means, and I'm not sure I like it. Anyway, we don't do this anymore. All right, then it talks about being engaged and so forth. All right, so, again, the point here, and let's go back to um, this right here, I suppose. Let me look over here at the... At the there we go. Um, and is it focusing in? Yeah, it looks pretty good. All right. Uh, the point here is, again, that this whole idea that we depend so heavily on culture, and it's really, really difficult for us to imagine that our culture isn't natural, which is, to the institutionalist, a big mistake. Because then you're thinking, you know, well, our economic system, this is just the way it is. I mean, this is the way it should always be, uh, when in fact, our economic system evolved. We didn't have this system uh, three or four hundred years ago, right? Uh, and so as a consequence, how could it be natural? Uh, and, and otherwise, we have this sort of Marxist idea that, oh, well, no, uh, it evolved, but this is the ultimate endpoint. Now it stops, all right? Uh, that capitalism, uh, the market system, is the ultimate system. Uh, and, and, which, which, of course, ignores the fact that capitalism itself can be organized several different ways. Now, let's see here. I wanted to tell you one more thing about, uh, and I think I know what the next slide is. Let me check here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's where I, that's where I thought we were going. All right. Um, and let me make sure I didn't skip anything here. No, I didn't. Okay, all right. So, let me tell you one more thing here about... Hello, John. Uh, when I was trying to figure this all out for myself, when I was trying to read about institutionalism and, and, and to try to make this mental leap uh, to understand, to, to start looking at the world differently, to start looking at the world in a way that you think to yourself that everyone doesn't necessarily do it this way. How much of what I do, and I'm going to use the word rational here, uh, but we're going to use a different one eventually. Um, and how much of it is just because that's the way we do it and there's no sort of rational underpinning to it. Um, and so, I'm thinking all this, right? And I'm walking to my car and I'm walking past someone's vehicle that has hanging off the rear view mirror a dead man. I had never seen it that way before. And I thought, that's really weird. If you pull yourself out of this culture and you see what that person has, has hanging off their rearview mirror, that's kind of horrifying. It was a dead man. 
all right, as someone who had been killed by capital punishment, it was, of course, Christ on a crucifix. All right? I mean, in having gone to Catholic school for 12 years, I mean, it's in front of every church, and some of these Catholic churches. I used to get um, uh, birthday and Christmas cards from some of my uh, English relatives who are really Irish. Um, and so you'd have like this, Happy Birthday, John, with the Sacred Heart of Jesus on the front, which is like this heart with... Uh, um, uh, uh, oh, oh that, that's another friend of mine. Uh, that's Mike... Uh, hold up. Mike, I will call you later. Perhaps you'll watch this video at some point. Um, but I can't answer that right now. All right, so, uh, anyway, um, and I was thinking, oh, so, yeah, the card, all right? So it's got a heart on the front with these thorns wrapped around it and blood dripping down. Oh, thank you, Aunt Pat. That's just lovely. Uh, so the Catholic stuff can get really gory, all right? Uh, and I got to thinking, wow, what if Jesus had been hanged, which would have been a much more humane way to die? Uh, we had a, uh, a priest traveling to different um, Catholic high schools throughout, I don't know, it was throughout the United States or throughout the South or whatever, but he was giving a special presentation on what it was like to be crucified, all right? Uh, to say, you know, oh, we all focus on Jesus rising from the dead, but what about the pain that Jesus went through as a human it was horrifying. First of all, the, the nails have to go through down here. Because if you put them here, the hand will just rip out, all right? Uh, and the Romans did this, all right? The Romans, uh, this is now, you know, if you are not a Christian, you may be saying, you know, well, but that, that didn't really happen. Oh, the Romans did this, though, all right? So the Romans, will, you know, if they're going to uh, nail somebody rather than tie them up, they're going to put the, the, the nail through down here. Apparently, there's a lot of nerve endings right there. It's horribly painful. And then when you're holding yourself up like this, uh, if you slouch down, which of course you're going to want to do after a couple of hours because you're exhausted, uh, you'll start to suffocate. So you're desperately trying to hold yourself. It is a horrible way to die. Being hanged would have been much more humane, much faster, right? But think about this. At the front of every Catholic church, there would be Jesus hanging from a noose. People would wear as jewelry nooses in the same way that they wear crosses. And, I, and when I got to thinking about this, I like, oh my God. I'd never looked at it that way before because you see your own culture and you take it for granted. And this is something that the institutionalists, uh, that Veblen, were trying to break people away from. You have to understand, you have to be able to take a step back from your own culture and see how much of this crap are you doing? Is it just crap? All right. Uh, so uh, I would rather, not, well, let's see. Um, Okay, well, let's go to the next slide. All right. Uh, because what I'm worried about right now is that Melanie's going to show up here at one point, uh, and I'm going to have to stop, and I don't want to be in the middle of something uh, when I have to stop and unload the car. Uh, let's see. So I did all that. All right. L let me make this point right now. Yeah, let's do this. Let's do this. All right. So let's go to the next slide. And this is the answer to study question number... 93. So we've skipped over 90, 91, and 92. I'll talk about those uh, later. But uh, 93. Uh, oh, I forgot. Actually, I use part of 90 and 91 uh, and 92 to make this definition here. So I should probably do this real quick. All right. So, uh, which you can't see anyway. Um, all right. I wanted to define in study questions 90, 91, and 92 conspicuous consumption. Uh, a term you've probably heard. It means that you're buying stuff to show off how, how, how wealthy you are, right? And conspicuous consumption, and, and I guess I should really write this on the board, but um, I'm sorry, I apologize. I'm just going to do it this way. Uh, let's see here. Focus, focus, focus. Lavish spending on goods or services with the primary goal of displaying social status, all right? I'm going to leave that there for a second. You can pause the video or something and then write it down. Now, Veblen made up this term. He was saying that at the turn of the century, he was witnessing, uh, the, 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 the Mayhew article is really good on this, uh, that comes at the end of all these readings, um, saying that there were people engaging in conspicuous consumption. There are these filthy rich people for the first time in, in capitalism, at any rate. We'd had them, obviously, under uh, um, you know, monarchy and uh, aristocracy. Uh, but these, uh, the Vanderbilts and the Carnegies and so forth, uh, and they were living lifestyles. They had so much money, they didn't know what to do with it. So they're... They're spending money in a manner to simply demonstrate, I have a lot of money. Conspicuous consumption. Now, a related concept, also coined by Veblen, is invidious distinction. Let me show this up here. Focus, there it goes. A distinction calculated to create animosity, resentment, or envy. All right, and I'll pause there and write that down. Okay. Um, and... 
An invidious distinction is one that is intended to make somebody else look bad, right? Uh, like, for example, when, uh, well, racism, uh, sexism, very clearly, this isn't uh, a, a sort of um, innocuous rule of our culture. It is intended to make one person powerful and another person uh, oppressed. Um, the fact that, okay, when I was a kid, Nobody wore their baseball caps backwards unless they were a catcher on a baseball team. And yet it became, you know, culturally, you know. But, but uh, well, actually there is some... Uh, ooh, where's my backpack? I was going to do this one before anyway. Um, all right. Here I'm going to show you where I am uh, a bad person. Okay. You're going to notice this from now on. I, I've had students afterwards bring this up continuously for the rest of their time at TCU. I'm a one-strapper. All right. I can't put both arms through. Um, because when I was in school, only nerds put both arms through. Nowadays, two-strapping is the norm. And yes, I did notice this originally in one of the um, 22 or, uh, uh, or 21 Jump Street movie. 21 Jump Street. Um, great film. And so, I can't put both arms through. And here's the deal. There are days when I have so much crap in my backpack that it cuts off the blood circulation and my arm hurts. And obviously, with both arms through, it distributes the weight better. I can't do it. I can't do it. And why? Because it is burned in my mind that only inferior people put both arms through. All right? There's an invidious distinction there. The whole idea was that I'm going to carry my backpack this way so I look cool. All right? uh, and, and the people who don't do that also probably have pocket protectors and their calculator, uh, which we don't have anymore, of course, on a little, uh, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it? Uh, a, a attachment thing on their belt or something like that. So I can't do it because it is so driven into my brain that two arms through is goofy, right? So invidious distinction is something where one group is basically trying to say that by following this rule, I am better than you, right? Oh, uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson apparently was known for not wanting to follow rules of etiquette. Like, for example, I'm not using the fork on the outside. I'm going to use the fork on the inside. Uh, and you know why? Because those stupid Brits and their aristocracy are the ones that made up these rules that have no logic underlying them. There's no reason why it can't be the inside spoon. I mean, um, and so he said, I'm not going to follow your rule. Uh, because that rule was intended to make some people look dumb. The people who didn't know how to use their um, uh, cutlery. Now, cultural relativity. That's 92. Focus. There it is. The idea that the propriety of a belief or activity is a function of the culture in which it is practiced. Pause your uh, video there and write that down. All right. Stuff that is culturally relative is appropriate in one culture and not in another. Uh, asking somebody on the airplane what they do for a living is perfectly appropriate in the United States. It's not in England. Uh, maintaining eye contact may be perfectly appropriate with any class or age of an individual in the U.S. It is not necessarily in Korea, all right? So these things, whether or not something is right, is relative to the culture in which it is practiced. That's what cultural relativity means. Whether it is right, whether it is appropriate, is entirely a question of which culture you're in. Now, uh, if it's negative 10 degrees Fahrenheit, it is not cultural that you probably should put a coat on or you're going to die, all right? There, there, there's an underlying logical reason for that, uh, but whether or not you maintain eye contact is entirely arbitrary, all right, the way this has evolved. Okay, I think I'm going to stop here before I get to the next concept and wait for Melanie to get home. Um, so, I shall return. Hey, let's see here. Ah, I was going to share that.